Wild Fed is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Check out SirThrival.com for a full line of nutritional support products. Now's a good time of year to start thinking about building up your immune system as we head into winter. Sir Thrival's line of medicinal mushroom formulas are the best in the industry and their colostrum product. And you know, colostrum has been shown to have very broadly antiviral properties, including against the flu. Uh, it's part of my daily morning smoothie. It's the ingredient that I use to tie everything together. It's also a good time of year to invest in a vitamin D formula as we descend into the darker part of the year. And Sir Thrival has an excellent vitamin D3. So check that out as well. You can find it all at SirThrival.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Welcome to episode three of the Wild Fed podcast. This show is with Deb Perkins, a wildlife biologist who specialized in working with black bears, as well as having done some work with brown bears for a portion of her career as well. She is really passionate about bears, and that comes through in everything she says about them. So I'm really excited for you to hear this episode. Bears hold a really special significance for me too. In fact, bears were the first big game animal I'd successfully harvested um, before I'd even harvested my first deer. I've noticed that bears evoke a really powerful emotion in people, and I, I think that they occupy a unique place in human evolutionary psychology, probably due in part to the long and rich interactions we've had with them, both as their current eight extant species, but also as species that we shared the landscape with in the past who are no longer you know, represented amongst Earth's fauna, like the cave bear Ursus spileus of Europe and Asia that died out in the last glacial maximum something like 24,000 years ago. Or the short-faced bears, a really fascinating bear for me, you know, being a person born here in North America. Uh, they're from the genus Arctotus. There was two species. Um, and they went extinct something like 11,000 years before the present. Uh, but bears and humans have shared the landscape for a long time. Uh, however, most of us rarely encounter them outside of captivity, and that makes them really mysterious. And so conversations like these are particularly fascinating. Now, my opinion is that this podcast is a bit too short, since I could have talked to Deb for several more hours, not just about bears, but also about her current work in habitat design. So go over to wild-fed.com and click on the podcast button, and then uh, on the page for this episode, and leave me some feedback. Let me know what you think of this interview, and if you'd like me to get Deb back on the show. Of course, you can leave me feedback too on any of our social media sites. So just uh, choose posts associated with this episode and leave me feedback about the show. Uh, remember pre-sales of Wild Fed Season 1, the video show, the TV show, uh, and the Season 1 experience. That's my nine-week interactive program. Those sales are open now at wild-fed.com. Uh, episode 6, uh, which is probably one of my favorite episodes, probably my favorite episode out of the season. It features two black bear hunts, um, as well as our wild rice harvest. So if this content about bears is really interesting to you, you'll want to check out that episode. Lastly, new episodes of the podcast are released on Tuesdays, and next week will feature my good friend, the forager chef, Alan Burgo. So you aren't going to want to miss that one. Make sure you subscribe to the show. And remember, subscribing to the show doesn't just keep you up to date on episodes. It really helps us too. So if you care about the long-term viability of the show and you want me to keep bringing you episodes, leave me a five-star rating, a review, and subscribe to the show. That really helps with the rankings. That helps us with advertisers. That means we can keep making these shows. Uh, now enjoy episode three of the Wild Fed podcast, Mean Gene, Pisley's, and Habitat Design. Well, I am here with Deb Perkins of First Light. What's the entire name of the business? First Light Wildlife Habitats. I have been trying to get this interview with you for some time. I first met <laughs> you in Maine at a uh, talk you're giving at a local library uh, about your work with black bears. Yes. And I'd seen a flyer and I was like, I have to go to this. Um, I really enjoyed that talk, Deb. Oh, good. Thank I you really so did. much. I, I love talking about bears. Man, you had a, a fantastic presentation. Um, and we got to see a lot of images of your work over the years. And um, I thought you deftly handled some of the political parts of it. Thank you. Um, and I left feeling, because as someone who bear hunts, I left feeling both good about what I do and also far more educated about bears than I have ever been in the bear hunting world because that scene um, tends to, uh, it has like hunter wisdom, but mm -hmm. not necessarily 
ecological wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I had so many questions about bears that were, had gone right. unanswered. Um, and I left there with so much more appreciation for them as a species. I mean, I appreciated them in my heart, but I didn't have all of the ecological context. Um, and I also left it feeling like, man, if I could do it over again, I wish I was a field biologist for a mm -hmm. period of time in my life. So. I hear that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you do. I, I feel do. very fortunate that I, that I came into this career. Yeah, so I would love to um, start off by getting a little bit of background on um, your work as a biologist and what you've been involved in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd love to kind of talk about bears for a bit and get some of that information to the people listening. Um, and I'd also love to delve into the work you do now, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, maybe we could give a quick summation of what that is now, kind of share what First Light does. Sure. Yeah. So do you want me to do the background first? No, let's just so people know where this is okay. headed. Yep. Tell us about what First Light does. Yeah, so I'm a um, I'm an ecologist, as you mentioned, and I uh, work with I partner with uh, landowners who are interested in making their habitats more biodiverse. Their habitats being their yard, their patio, their thousand acres. So no matter what size property you have, it's a habitat it's to scalable. something. Scalable, you can yeah. scale this thing out. Yes, and um, so I work with clients, urban clients in places like Portland that have a quarter of an acre who want to make it more friendly to pollinators because they've heard about the decline and our very important pollinator species to people that have thousands of acres of forest land who want to manage that land for biodiversity and ecological health. And so I sort of do everything in between that quarter acre to I'm currently involved in a um, conservation plan for 6,000 acres oh, in down wow. East Maine. So yeah. at any scale, and that's what I tell people all the time is you can conserve nature right where you are. So no matter where you are, what your little slice of land looks like, you can make decisions that impact uh, wildlife species. And a lot of them are very accessible. You know, our pollinators and birds, for example, anyone living in an urban environment can um, do lots on their landscape to make it more friendly to birds and pollinators to provide them with the plants that they need. Uh, to provide them with the cover that they need, uh, you know, sometimes these birds will be migrating, and weather will come in, and they'll have they'll they'll have a, you'll have a fallout of migratory birds, some of the beautiful songbirds that we enjoy, and they just landfall wherever they do because of the weather. And so, if they're in an urban environment, when you say they fall out, can you explain to people what you mean? Yeah, they they they, they run into to bad weather and they emergency land, and so yeah, they have to come down exactly. And so if if they're over a city like Portland where there's some green space and there's, you know, people that have native plants and trees in their, in their um, yards, then that's a much friendlier place than landing in a, uh, you know, a highly uh, impacted paved world yeah, where there's, where there's no, you know, trees and shrubs. And I say native because uh, native trees and shrubs um, are living bird feeders for our birds mm -hmm. because they host caterpillars that feed, um, that are high protein sources and they, they are functional in the ecosystem. Uh, all these other sort of ornamental things that people plant, they sometimes provide a limited, uh, benefit, but they don't function in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. but that's a whole separate kind of yeah. discussion. But I, I just help people to make good choices about how they landscape and, um, we can do it. So it's aesthetically appealing, but it's also, um, they can have a local ecology that they can take pride in and they can see their landscape come alive. They can see yeah. the, the dynamic system. They can see the bees and the, and the birds actually foraging on their plants right. or, or, um, you know, getting shelter from, from a storm, um, on their property. So, uh, traditionally, you know, a lot of people landscaped sort of in this old sort of Victorian mm -hmm. way or, or the sort of English cottage garden way right, where it's right. all just very much for for eye candy and it's not really uh, thinking about, well, all of these properties, they all link to each other and they are part of a watershed, for example. Right. They're, they're mm -hmm. part of a, a bigger ecosystem. So trying to think about you can conserve nature right out your door, you know. And I, I feel like participating in something like that 
is a probably a great way to reduce the sense of guilt that people feel right now with our ecological situation. Exactly. Right? Cause it's so stressful not knowing what you can do mm -hmm. and just feeling like you're making some kind of contribution yes. kind of helps to reduce that feeling of helplessness. Oh, it's very concrete. I mean, I, I spoke at the main flower show. I do a lot of talks and uh, speaking events and I spoke at the main flower show and, and I just got a message from the woman yesterday. I posted something on Facebook. I do these phenology notes. So phenology is the study of nature and how it changes over the seasons. And so each week I post like, this is what's happening in nature now. And you'll get these sleeping bumblebees this time of year. I don't know if you've seen no. them on your flowers. But it was a post about that and, you know, sort of some facts about... You do this on your blog or your Instagram or both? Um, I do it on Instagram and Facebook. You have a beautiful Instagram feed, by the way. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. What, just real quickly, what is the handle there? First Light Habitats. Spell? F-I-R-S-T-L-I-G-H-T. Spell correctly. Habitats. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. So First Light is the name of my business because, um, you know, it's dawn. It's it's one mm -hmm. of the best times of, of, of the day and it's it's... You know, Maine is the first place we see the sunrise right. in, in the United States, and just kind of I'm trying to shine a light mm -hmm. for people. I'm trying right. to uncover what they what they can do. So, so first light, yes. Yeah, so a phenology note was about the sleeping bumblebees, and uh, this woman had seen me at the Maine Flower Show in March, and she said, "I can't tell you how much you changed the way I see everything." You know, and yeah. she said, "You got my nature motor going." She's that's yeah. how she put it. She said, "There's an apartment complex. She's in South Portland. There's an apartment complex going on right next to her," and she um, took some of my suggestions. And she just is seeing her landscape come alive mm -hmm. with with bees, um, in particular. So she just feels so excited about that. So yeah, I partner with people. I come out and do property consults. I do. I uh, partner with Larkspur Design, which is an ecological landscape company in Portland. And um, she, Shauna, who runs that, she has a crew. She's a you know landscaping company. So what we do is we go in and we do a habitat design. Oh, and then you have somebody who can help walk the steps out. They come in and they install really? the design. So oh, okay. So we have like this kind of full experience where you get oh, you get a consultation. I didn't realize it was such a clean package. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm the personal ecologist. So I. I'm I'm like a personal trainer, but yeah. you don't have to lift yeah. weights. You plant yeah. flowers and stuff. <laughs> right. So the personal call, just me, I come out and do a property consult. And then if people want to do a habitat design, that can be where they finish working with me or they can do a habitat design. And that could be a little pollinator garden. It could be a hedgerow for habitat um, of shrubs that also acts as a privacy screening, for example, or it can be, oh, this is how I think, you know, uh, this is this would be a great spot to have a habitat garden where you're actually putting in a lot of native plants, flowers and shrubs and, mm -hmm. um, and Larkspur will come out and install it. So, oh, that's cool. and they'll even maintain it for you. But, uh, so this, this movement of ecological landscaping is really, oh, is like really taking off. Back to the woman with the, um, that was reading your notes and had gotten so excited. I get challenged sometimes by the idea that nature is this thing that some people are into the way some people are into movies or some people are into novels mm -hmm. or some people are into bowling or whatever. Like, right. I don't like thinking of it as just this thing you could be into and therefore you might not be into. It's like, I feel like if you get the right hook, everybody's into it because mm -hmm. this is where we come from. It's not like bowling hasn't been here with us through our entire evolution. If you're into bowling, great, love it. But like everybody... Mm -hmm. Nat is nature right. at the root. It's so so it's just <laughs> about figuring out what is the hook that gets that person excited and then it snowballs. And then, yes. you know, I feel like that's so important right now because there's so many dissociated people yes. kind of running around in the world consuming, but not relating. Yes. Right. So, well, I say that all the time because I, I speak a lot in schools as well. I do uh, education. Um, I, I just spoke at Riverton elementary teaching them about pollinators mm -hmm. and, uh, Every child in that room was wrapped yeah. with attention. I was showing them these really cool macro photos of bees covered in pollen and what they <laughs> look like. And every single child yeah. in that classroom, there was 80 that I spoke to that day. All of them were, were really captivated. Yeah. And so that's what I say all the time as well, getting back to what you said, is everyone as a child is so into nature. You know, when do we get, like you said, diso disassociated or um, there's there's a, almost like a loss of wonder, yeah. which is really mm -hmm. uh, quite depressing if you think about it that way. But, but that's why I think the message really resonates with people about, you know, 
uh, getting into your local ecology and, and having agency over that, you know, being part of it, but also the piece that I'm talking about having agency is, you know, taking out non-native plants and putting a native plant back in. It's very concrete. And right now people are feeling very overwhelmed and depressed yeah. about the state of the environment. The climate crisis, thankfully, is finally getting a lot more uh, attention. Mm-hmm. And pe- but people, they, they grab onto something like this and they say, oh, I can do this. This mm-hmm. can make a difference. You know, the rusty patch bumblebee is uh, in, listed as endangered and we have not seen it in Maine to, since 2009. It's one of our 17 species of bumblebees. We have 17 in Maine. Wow. And they that. have not seen that bee. It used to be a huge proportion of the bumblebees in Maine in the 80s. And we're still looking for it. We might not find it again. But... Uh, it's just ra- its range is now south of here. Well, it's it, it's they don't really know what the exact range is. The historic range covered all of Maine and beyond, and it's it you know is quite a large range in 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 uh, the United States. You know, out to the Great Lakes and you know so- south. But if we don't find that bee, that will be one more mm-hmm. local extinction that 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 has happened. We don't know why, but there's also all of these other species of bees or birds and so if everyone in their yard was doing something a little different where they were actually providing a flower Mm -hmm. or a nesting habitat that these animals could use what a difference we'd make yeah build it they will come kind of yeah exactly and so it's just like voting you know Mm -hmm. that that if you know simple math you know that every vote does count right because it's math yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) it's and it's the same for you know doing this kind of ecological landscaping or um, landscaping for wildlife. So, I feel like people who've listened this far might be surprised to find out that you hunt. Um, and I want to circle back to it later, but talk about it for a moment now. Um, just hearing what you've said so far and the way that you've said it, there's like this division between how, I guess maybe the environmentalist and the conservationist maybe might, might be a classical way mm-hmm. to describe these two camps and, and labels are never helpful. They are, no, no, they aren't. But there is sort of this cultural bifurcation that happened where people who hunted kind of went in one direction and people who um, considered themselves environmentalists kind of went another direction. And now there's this gulf between them mm-hmm. and we're starting to see people who are bridging that gulf. And uh, I think you seem like one of those people because the types of things you have said up until this point sound like the kind of things somebody who would be against hunting would say. Right. Um, especially when you have described, uh, you did it right off the bat, just sort of describing layers like, like these native trees have caterpillars, which mm-hmm. lay, and there's these layers and layers and layers, which um, it's, I, I don't want to um, be too, a lot of hunters don't think in that way. Mm-hmm. The people who, who most anti-hunters picture as hunters don't think those many layers deep, right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of the stereotype of hunters. Mm-hmm. And that's all changing right now. It's an influx. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just curious if you'd speak to that for a moment. And like I said, I'd like to circle back and talk more about your relationship to hunting. But um, I think, does it surprise people that you do this kind of work and that yeah. you also have consumptive use oh, yeah. as well? Absolutely. And, you know, to be very frank, it's not the f- one of the first things I offer a new client. You know, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't happen to mention <laughs> of it. Of course, yeah. Um, because uh, I often see people visibly surprised mm-hmm. if, I, if it comes up and I mention it. Um, but a lot of my clients are those people who are having a lot of damage by deer in their gardens. Yeah. So uh, helping people to make that connection between, you know, you will have the people that will say, let nature take its course, Mm -hmm. you know, let the nature will balance itself out. And that may be the case if we're talking about before we colonize this part of the world, Right. Uh, you know, and native Americans in the numbers that they were and the way they lived on the landscape, they were very much part of the, of the landscape. But when Europeans came and we colonized and now we've, you know... Like astronauts coming from another planet that <laughs> right. we colonized, right? And the way that we... Yeah, the things that we brought and the way that we live and how we sort of... S- dominion over the earth was very mm-hmm. much the way yeah. that, um, you know, this this history of our relationship to the earth, ha- you know, has evolved. Um, but we can't let nature take its course mm-hmm. because 
we have impacted it to such a degree that we are all over the landscape. Mm -hmm. Not only we as a species are all over the landscape, but all of our, you know, everything that we bring with us, you know, all of our machines and our uh, industrial, you know, infrastructure that we brought with us. And so that's fragmented a lot of habitat. It's, we brought in invasive species, we brought in exotic animals from other parts of the world. We, you know, we're dealing with a lot of that with insects and mm-hmm. forestry. We've you know, denuded so much of what was here. Yes. And we've changed it. We've altered it uh, forever. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we can try to restore habitats, which is work that continues to go on. But, you know, I, I think about Maine before, mm-hmm. you know, this place was settled. And it you know, it was, there were no trees because it was, everyone was farming it. And then, no, so now we have a second growth forest and now we're into like, you know, multiple generations of trees growing and being harvested. But what must those old growth forests in Maine, mm-hmm. what they must have looked like and the way that the wildlife interacted on those lands, on that landscape. But that's not the world we live in anymore. Mm-hmm. And so active management is really essential and it's part of our history as as a country uh, you know part of our um the conservation movement was mm-hmm. founded by hunters um so yeah. it, you know reminding people of those connections and also that um, including what i just want to add like including to the um idea of of national forest and of um the parks and all of that like this whole idea of public land like a lot of that comes like it was hunters who yeah. came up with a lot of these concepts. Right, exactly. And a lot of the conservation that's happened um, historically in Maine has been um, due to the revenue brought in mm-hmm. by hunting and fishing, for example. But yes, it does surprise people. And um, I it, it, I often don't have the time to go into it, <laughs> yeah. which, is, which is so sort of yeah. luxurious about this conversation is because yeah. we can, and our, and our listeners can be thinking about this in a, bigger you know through a bigger lens because it, it's it's complicated it's yeah. not simple and so uh yeah we'll go back to it and and we'll touch on it again but but to me it's it's essential as part of having healthy wildlife populations um yeah. to be using uh you know judicious methods of hunting you know um that are rooted in science and we we, we know so much about our wildlife populations because we have so many good biologists mm-hmm. that are constantly tracking those populations and helping us figure out, you know, at what, at what rate can we harvest these animals? Right. Um, and at what rate should we, mm-hmm. and, uh, to keep them healthy because, yeah. you know, we've removed a lot of the natural predators, you know, mm-hmm. we've, we've removed a lot of the mechanisms on the environment that are natural, that, yeah. that would have kept those systems in balance. And I don't really love that term, um, you know, balance for nature because it's highly stochastic. Yeah. It's all over the place. Very dynamic balance if it's a balance, right? Yes. But it, you know, it does eventually those, those, um, you know, peaks and valleys, they do, you know, uh, settle out and, and nature does kind of come up, come up with a, with a balanced setting, but it's usually short term. And then some, another variable comes in, but we are the huge variable on the landscape. Yeah, you know, I want to speak to two things that you said. The there was a bee you mentioned, the rust. What did you call it? Rusty patch bumblebee. Okay, if the rusty patch bumblebee was an animal that people hunted, mm-hmm. we would know a lot more about where they are. They would be, you know what I mean? Like one of the things people don't realize about hunting is that once you put, I hate to put it in these terms, but once you put value on a species, mm-hmm. because there's people who want to chase that species. Now that species doesn't go away, mm-hmm. right? Like not exactly. like it did in the old days. I understand with yes. passenger pigeons and things like that. Like, right. <clears throat> but now that we have this North American model of conservation, putting that attention on an animal really um, makes ensures that that animal will be around because now you have scientific management, right. which you know it's unfortunate for the species that um, people don't think about or know about. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to just say that the permaculturalist uh, Ben Falk from Vermont, we were talking about this idea of should we manage landscapes or not? And he said to me, look, if I break your leg and then I go, well, I'll just let nature take its course. Mm-hmm. It's going to heal really bad. Yeah. He's like, exactly. if I break your leg, I need to set the leg, set the bone so that it heals properly. And mm-hmm. we've gone out and broken nature's leg. And we, now to say, oh, let's just wash our hands of it and we'll just let it heal itself. It's, it doesn't work quite that way. Yeah. Right. So I yeah, think that's, that's a great example. 
Absolutely. Um, tell me about your early career. How did you get into ecology? What 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 led you down that road um, early on, earliest that you remember? Well, it, it's very disorienting these days because I, I have a hard time believing I've been doing this for 25 years. I still feel like I'm a, a mm. youngster in the field sometimes. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I was about 19 and I had gone to, um, well, let me go way back and say, because I think it, it's... Please do. I think it's relevant. I loved nature from a very young age, you know, born and raised in Maine. And um, I I just wanted to be outside, uh, enjoyed camping, um, just being on the land as much as I could. What part of Maine? Um, I grew up in Cumberland. Okay. Yeah. About oh. 25 miles from here. Sure. And um, it was a great place to grow up in the 70s and 80s. It's changed a lot. Um, but it was, it was wonderful. You're we pretty had- equidistant to the sea and the mountains there, right? So you kind of can get... You can get over to the White Mountains pretty easy. You can get down to the coast. You know, I feel easy. where we are right now is very much equidistant yeah. between Portland and the mountains. I, you know, we were pretty close to Portland, but okay. I was very close to the coast as well. And, oh yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. But you know, I mean, and we lived in in a neighborhood, but you know, we'd be out all day, you know, and mm-hmm. every mother had a different you know, signal for their kid to come home. Uh, some people had a cowbell. I had one of those air horns. Really? Yeah. My, my mom to call like my brother. Canister, yeah. To call my yeah. brother and I home. Aww. It was the air horn. Cause we, we were out building forts and we were like, we were very tribal and we would like have these, you know, fights against each other in these war games that would kind of play out. And, you know, we'd play or the flies. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just, it was, it was great. And I, I loved nature and I, you know, people say it's one of the worst questions to ask a kid. What do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. Um, because you are who you are. What, yeah. what, it's not what you do. It's who you are. But anyway, um, so I didn't know that you could be a wildlife biologist or ecologist. I had no idea. Um, so when it came time for me to apply for colleges, I was at the Common Ground Fair way back when, early days in Windsor. And I don't know, it must have been 1988, uh, maybe, something like that. And uh, I saw this sign, and it was uh, Sterling College, Working Hands, Working Minds. And it was two dirty hands holding a seed. And I just said, that, that's where I want to go to college. I don't know anything about it, but that's where I want to go. And and my mom was very supportive and it was kind of, it was beyond our means because we, she was a single mother and we didn't have very much money and um, she just wanted to support my dream. So we went and looked at it and um, there I found out that they had a, they had a two year degree in natural resource management with a concentration in wildlife. So that's how it started. But I thought if I wanted to be outside, well, I guess I'll be a forester. Yep. And that's kind of what I thought when I was like 17. Um, I, I knew I loved animals, but I didn't want to be a vet. And I didn't know right. there was anything else, right. any other options. That's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to kids about what I do, because letting them know this it, is an it option. Exists. Yeah. You can do this. So so that's how I got started. And Sterling was wonderful. It's a very experiential uh, college. They want you to be doing the things, not just sitting in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And it's this, it, at the time, it was the smallest co-educational accredited college in the country. So there was 80 students at this college. It's in northeastern Vermont. And, um, you know, our first week, we did night orienteering with a compass. And, oh, cool. and we learned how to use map and compass. And they dropped us off in the middle of the mountains. And they said, the van will be here. And you guys need to find how to get there. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I bonded with my classmates my first week of college. But it's a great way to bond. It was wonderful. Orienteering really. And everyone had together. to take a turn leading. Yeah. And some you're like, oh, no, it's them again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so Sterling, uh, part of our second year, we had to go ha- get an internship. We had to go do an internship somewhere. And um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, the president of the college at that time had a, had a connection to the University of Tennessee, where there's a long running still bear study. And, Did uh, you have an interest in bears at the time? Or I had was an interest in wildlife. Of, right. I wanted to do something with... It was with, vague still. I, I was very drawn in by the charismatic megafauna. So sure, aren't we all? wolves, bears, I wanted to do something big and sexy and yeah. interesting. So, um, you know, uh, something dramatic. So I heard about this and I applied. I couldn't wait. So at 19, I went down there and had my first inter- internship with bears and they were my first So you didn't have any love. problem getting the internship? I imagine I there's a lot of people who are interested in that. Sterling has a very good reputation. Okay. Or it, it did at the time. It's it's even more amazing now. Uh and so they knew that Sterling College kids work hard. So 
Uh, I went down there for my first winter, and I did den work down there, which was big bears down there. I bet, huh? I know North Carolina's bears are pretty big. Um, they are not very. They were not very big. No. Um, I didn't actually see a lot of bears that winter because a lot of the radio collars had um, fallen off. So telemetry collars, then radio telemetry collars, and that's how we find where they are in the den in the winter time. Yeah. And I can't remember the history now. It was a long time ago. It's 1993, but uh, I think. Whoever was putting the collars on uh, during trapping season put them on a little too loose, <laughs> yeah. and the bears slipped them. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but it was a great experience, and I just had was obsessed with bears from then on, and just thought they were fascinating animals. And so, I went on to study bears pretty intensively for about eight years. Black bears and brown bears. So I I did that work in Tennessee on black bears. I finished up at Sterling. I ended up uh, transferring out to the University of Montana, where I got my undergrad degree in wildlife. And uh, I came back one summer and worked for the for, for Maine, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife on bears, because I, I really had enjoyed the bear work so much. And then uh, the summer after that was summer 95. The summer after that, I uh, got work in Yellowstone National Park, wow. working with the uh, interagency grizzly bear study team. Wow. So I got to go out and live trap grizzly dream, bears. Dream job right there. <laughs> uh, and, they, and they were, you know, cowboy biologists. And, and they're like, these aren't black bears, little girl. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at uh, recently, I got interested, uh, as I showed you before, uh, harvested a pretty big bear this year, a pretty big black bear. So I started looking at bear skull comparisons, you know, black mm-hmm. bear, brown bear, polar bear and I got kind of drawn in by those short faced bears now extinct, you know, mm-hmm. just looking at the skulls. And it occurred to me that the grizzly bear is compared to a black bear. It's like looking at a homo sapien skull and like a Neanderthal skull, right? right? Like right. The, just the size of the brow ridges mm-hmm. and the, uh, you know, all the condyles and everything is just so beefed up and robust. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, I, yeah. I have no real experience with brown bears. So. Oh, it's interesting. There's a lot of morphology characteristics that are different between the black, the brown and the polar bear. Mm-hmm. And you can tell what they eat and what their behavior is based on what they look like. You know, the, the brown bear has that. And when I say brown bear, Every grizzly bear is a brown bear, but not every brown bear is a grizzly bear because right. a grizzly bear is a subspecies of a brown bear. Mm-hmm. And we, we refer to grizzly bears as those, those uh, brown bears that are interior in the Rockies, for example. When they're you, smaller than the coastal brown bears? They're, they're smaller, yes. But are they more aggressive? They are. So, so that's Ursus arctos? Ursus arctos horribilis. It, yeah, like horrible, yeah, right? Is yeah, the grizzly exactly okay? So subspecies of the brown bear, exactly. Mm-hmm. So the co- and are the brown bear and the polar bear more closely related to each other than they both are to black bears? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, they're hybridizing now. Yeah. So you're wow. getting the pizzlies. Is this a? Is this oh pizzly? They've actually documented. Really? Uh, yes. What do they look like? With climate change, the brown bear range is going north, okay. and the polar bear range is coming south. Yeah. And they're um, hybridizing, and and they they look kind of what you'd expect them to look like. Their their uh, you know their coat color is light, very light, and and they have like both kind of characteristics. It's been a while since I've seen one, yeah. but I did. Uh, there, there's a couple documentaries that talk about oh, okay. it. Okay, well, maybe um, I'll get so the names the, of those. The Pizzly, yeah. So the fact that they can hybridize tells you they're pretty close, yeah. closely related. Um, and hybridize, I just mean that those two species can breed and have a viable offspring. Um, yeah, are those offspring? Vi- can those offspring reproduce? That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I would expect that they someone does at this point yeah. because I, it's been going on for long enough okay. that I just for context for the listener, a lot of times hybridized species are not reproductive. That's right. right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, I, so I studied grizzly bears in Yellowstone. Um, we were doing hair snares, which were really pretty cool, non-intrusive studies where we were uh, attracting bears to uh, some kind of bait um, in the Tetons or in Yellowstone somewhere. And that they would, they would have to like scooch under or walk over a barbed wire and they'd leave hair behind and we'd do DNA analysis on the hair. Okay. Uh, and so the, the, there was also the live trapping and the radio collaring studies that I did. Um, but then I... And like culvert style traps you'd live trap? Yes. Yes. Man, what's that like walking into that? That's pretty exciting. I, I mean, I is. was... So this was 1996, so I was 23. And it was very exciting. 
Uh, I, f- I couldn't believe that I had this opportunity, yeah. that th- I had this job. Uh, there was a, a great people that I worked with and just fascinating research and um, just fascinating uh, uh, management challenges um, with such a large, aggressive, kind of a c- iconic yeah. uh, top-level predator species, you know, in, in uh, Yellowstone. Of course, when I say predator... They're they're really omnivores, yeah. you know, but they they certainly uh, feel very threatening to humans. Some, somebody was saying to me recently, I'm curious your feedback on this. As somebody who gets to be around a lot of black bears, people often act like, wow, that must be so scary. And I say, you know, black bears, I don't find in most instances, they seem very eager to get away from people. Mm-hmm. I've never had one exactly. aggress toward me. And somebody said to me recently that black bears evolved in a forest environment where they could easily escape, climb trees, get away, and that the grizzly and brown bears evolved in a more plains environment where retreat isn't really an option. So stand at your ground is is the MO for them and probably similar to polar bears. Would you say that that's true or makes sense to you? Or, or is uh, Absolutely. I, I, I'd have to think about the polar bear a little bit more. But, polar um, bear seems to me like, hey, I just have to eat anything I come across. Like, sorry. Well, the, but but no, they're highly specialized. They eat seals. Yeah, that's their number one diet item. They're they're not omnivores like our black and brown bears. They but they could. I mean, they wouldn't really even have much. Do they have access to many like grasses, forbs, fruits, right? Things like that? Um, well, if you go to a place like Churchill, you'll see that they're eating that sort of stuff on land okay. at the right times of year right. and that kind of thing. But they're definitely. Marine mammals. Yeah. You know, they're, okay, they're right. made to eat seals, but yeah. And they're, they're Ursus maritimus. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting, yes. uh, so like a sea bear. Maritime. Kind of, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you know, when I think of the climate crisis and what's happening, they are the, th- my husband had been invited to go. Uh, he's a seabird scientist and he had been invited to go guide on this big cruise ship and to be a seabird guide. Because now... Bird watching. Yes. And now that they're going through um, at the top of the world because everything is melted. Wow. Um, okay. They have, so they have ship the, the access The Northwest Passage, routes. yes. Right. Okay. So, um, so shipping routes are opening um, because of the melting. What a time of the, of the of the Of the Arctic. So uh, it was, on the one hand, he had the opportunity to... to address these people on these boats who may have the means to donate to, um, you know, conservation, environmental issues. So you could, but at the same time, you're on this, this ship that's like a city and it has shopping malls and, uh, nightclubs. and so it's, it's not in alignment with our values, mm-hmm. but, and so he was trying to decide if he should do this or not. And I said, well, pull up the website. And the website, the poster image on the website was this massive cruise ship, which were really hard for me to look at because mm-hmm. I think about the carbon footprint of those things. Mm-hmm. And then in in the foreground was a polar bear stranded on an ice pan. Oh, man. And <laughs> to, poignant. to them, that was probably this really great marketing photo right? because you could see a polar bear. And all I could think of was this polar bear has no pack ice its habitat is pack ice. It needs seals to survive. If there's no pack ice, there's no hunting seals. They're starving. Yeah. And the there's, irony of the cruise ship there, right. right? That's partially responsible for this problem. Yes. <laughs> and and they're swimming such distances to try to find new pack ice to hunt seals that okay. they're actually, they're drowning and dying of star- starvation. Okay. So when I think about climate change, to me, people need to go to the front lines and they need to think about what's happening in the Inuit communities with the Inuit people who have subsisted on whales and, you know, um, other resources that are now at peril because of climate change. So, but um, that to me was a very poignant image Mm -hmm. of of climate change. So, um, I don't know. How did we get there? Uh, We were talking about, well, we were talking about, I had, (laughs) I had asked you about the idea that maybe these animals had evolved these different temperaments based on oh, yes, the yes. environment they were yeah, in. The, oh, right, because you said in the polar bear. Yes, exactly. We'll I, leave the polar bear out because that's we'll let you think about that one. Yes, exactly. But yes, the grizzly, um, well, especially because I talked to people because I, um, after I worked in Yellowstone, I also uh, 
was supervising a black bear study in New Mexico, which was really, really exciting, different habitat. I just don't think of bears in New Mexico. I mean, that's a flaw in my thinking about their distribution and range because I picture them, or maybe it's a mistake in how I picture New Mexico. Well, maybe. um, What is the landscape like in which bears are found there? Um, the study area that we were in was a 200 square mile study area. And we have, we had everything from desert Canyon to, to Douglas fir forest. Cause I would picture them in that, but they would, they go down into desert Canyon. Yeah. They, they, um, when the prickly pear fruits are ripe, they go down and eat prickly pear. Oh, and, that's cool. And they have these purple cow oh, patty, love to see that. you know, scats. How do, I'm, I know I'm going to, now I'm, I'm very excited <laughs> about bears. So I'm going to rabbit trail here for a second. I look at bear scat and I go, how is this bear extracting any nutrients from this? This looks like I took the food and put it in a blender. Right. Where, how are they getting so fat? I mean, you know, you'll mm-hmm. see this four or five inch layers of fat in these bears and the food looks like it's undigested. In in the case of you're seeing skins on fruits let's and things say, like that? Yeah, let's say I'm looking at like they're, they're eating choke cherries. They're mm-hmm. eating blueberries. It just looks like somebody mashed up blueberries yeah. and left it in a pile. I think that's because you're seeing the skins. Okay. You know, and, and everything else has been absorbed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, New Mexico was, was then a stop on my journey. And then um, I did end up working in Alaska on the coastal brown bear for the wow. park service, which was really exciting. So the reason I'm pointing that out in answer to your original question about behavioral differences, aggression between black bears and brown bears, there's also a behavioral difference between the coastal brown bears and the interior brown bears are grizzly bears. And that's primarily, they're primarily more aggressive because they're, they're, the food is not as abundant. Coastal resources feed the brown bears. Coastal resources they are They can be rich. more relaxed, yeah. There's salmon, there's clams, there's incredible herbaceous growth. You know, it, I mean, Alaska just is such a productive habitat. And so bears, not only are they less aggressive to humans there, but they also tolerate other bears in very close proximity Mm -hmm. so So that imagery that we see of of you know multiple bears all together mm -hmm. on a sort of a it looks like a shared food Mm resources just because abundance allows them to relax their attitude a little bit yeah so when i first got my job in alaska um i it was my dream to study bears in alaska and I, i applied for this job and i i remember i was in maine in between things back home and I, I had kind of a preliminary phone interview and, and they were probably interviewing all kinds of people that wanted to work on this bear study, you know? And I said, oh, well, uh, oh, you're going to be at the International Bear Association meeting in Tennessee on such and such a date. Oh, I'm going to be there. I just made it up. And I'm pointing this out because I always, I tell this a lot to young people. It's like, you've got to get in front of somebody. Everything's about relationships, mm-hmm. you know? So I got in my car and my, my old Subaru, I had like a sock over the carburetor because, well, that's another story. <laughs> but I drove down to Tennessee and I, and I met this guy for the interview and I got the job and it was just a dream job. And so I'm flying in this, you know, um, Beaver, you know, Cessna Beaver okay. um, plane, a fixed wing plane over the pass in a you know, trying to get out from King Salmon, Alaska, out to the coast. And we'd been waiting for three days for the weather to be right, right because you have to have a high enough ceiling so that you can get over these mountains. And we're flying over, oh, we're starting to come up over the pass. And all of a sudden, the plane dies. The engine Everything, cuts. Yep, the engine cuts, total silence. And the pilot jumps about a foot in the air. And I think this is not a good sign if he's surprised. And he had forgotten to switch the tanks. So the first tank ran out of gas and he didn't, he had forgotten to switch it to the second tank when he was low on fuel Uh on the first tank. But we immediately just started dropping toward the mountains. And uh, I thought I was going to die at that point. The second point where I felt that my life might be severely threatened was when we flew out over where we were going to land and I could see how many brown bears were on yeah, the landscape yeah. and they were dropping us off with our tents for the summer <laughs> right so we're we had we were in this place that has the second largest tides in the world shalikoff strait and kodiak island is across we were in katmai national park uh it's become a very famous place hallow bay so we we were landing there and the the tides go out so fast that this guy he, it was a float plane so he has floats and if your floats get stuck in the mud flats you're you're there for the next whole tidal cycle. So right. he starts yelling at us, get your stuff out of the plane, get your stuff Lighten out of the, the plane. Or- 
Yeah, yeah, because he had to leave, and right. he keeps moving the moving the you know the 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 plane around to keep the floats from sticking. And I'm looking up onto the beach, and there's bears everywhere. And um, so that's that's to give you an idea of the concentration, the density. It's the highest density of and brown these bears. These bears are are coast got coastal resources, so they must be huge. Yeah, they're they're big. What's and a big one? Way. Um, you know, I'm a little rusty on some of that. Rough, roughly. Um, but some of them would be 1,500 pounds. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. 1,500 pounds. Like a really big one. Um, oh, man. So so he's throwing our stuff on the beach, and we walk up, and the beach, I remember it was just a labyrinth of bear tracks. Yeah. Like a maze of bear tracks, because when the tide goes out, these bears go out and clam. Right. And they dig clams. When the tide comes in, they go up into the sedge meadows and they, they forage on green growth. And some of these sedges are really high in protein. So they're actually able to get fat eating these sedges. And then when the salmon runs start, it's the foliage or it's the seeds. It's the foliage. Really? Yeah. Foliage okay. and seeds. They eat all, they yeah, eat, eat the all whole, the whole plant, just grazing it down. Yeah. They're really grazing on the, on these sedge meadows. But, um, there, like I said, there was, it is the highest density of brown bears in the world. So they, that that habitat supports an incredible number of bears. Do we? Has there been much work done on the intelligence of bears, and do we know anything about, say, brown bears versus black bears in their? Um, I don't know if the word would be IQ or their problem solving. I, I notice that they have pretty large brains. The brain case is pretty mm-hmm, big, and mm-hmm. um, when I look into the eyes of one, I feel like I'm. This bear understands why mm-hmm. we're there. Oh yeah, they're they're and, re- very intelligent. Yeah, and they live quite a long time mm-hmm. too, right? So what's a yeah. what are what are sort of long lived black and brown bears? A long lived in the wild black bear is um, high twenties. Yeah, you learn a lot um, when you when you speak to Randy. He'll be able to tell you what okay. the um, record is for their study. They've they've tracked something like eight generations of bears in Maine. Okay. So he'd be able to tell you what the oldest bear was that they've, that they've uh, sampled or known about. But um, I remember in New Mexico, there was a bear who's the same age as me. And I, at the time I was uh, 24 and she, and um, oh, I, then I went back to do the den work. So she was something like 26 or 27 about the wow. same time I was. And um, she was a really smart bear and she, she'd, uh, lived her life in a area with a lot of hunting pressure yep. hounds. And, um, I had an experience with her that told me why she lived so long, but well, do you want to share it? If, if you want me to, if you're comfortable to, Oh yeah. Um, her, she was kind of uh, nicknamed mean Jean in the bear, <laughs> bear crew. Yeah. She was not mean at all. She was really smart. But, um, when we live trap bears to put radio collars on them, we use, we use a snare, like an Aldrich foot snare. Yeah. And so, can you describe that real quickly for people? Yeah, so an Aldrich foot snare is basically a cable, and it makes a loop, and you um, fasten it to a tree. So just picture a, a metal cable that has kind of a loop, and there's there's um, a kind of a perpendicular piece that lets that loop kind of get bigger and smaller. Okay, it gets tighter, but but it probably doesn't loosen, right? It's a exactly one way. Yep. yes, and then you anchor that to the tree. And then there's a spring that's a separate thing that you use. So you dig a hole in the ground near the tree um, and you set that spring in such a way that the loop hangs over it. it the loop is placed over it. And underneath is, is that empty space of the hole you've dug. And so you cover that, you, you set that snare around, that snare will basically make a loop around that hole in the ground. And uh, then five, six inches or so. That something big, like that. Yeah. yeah. And then you cover it with moss and mm-hmm. leaves and a little bit of duff and just make it look like a nice place to step because oh, yeah. bears okay. like to step. Yeah. You know, those bear trails in Katmai in Alaska, it you would walk on those. And as a human, it felt really awkward to walk on them because they're made for a bear gate. And you, you can actually put your hand in and you can feel the depressions where generations and generations of bears have put their foot in the same place. Wow. So you, it's not a smooth trail. It has these little pock marks for, well, not little because they have big feet, but it has these depressions. So you make it look like a nice place to step and, the, and you put bait there. 
and the, the bear will step in there and the aldrich foot snare will um, tighten around the wrist of the bear because the spring, yeah. the spring, you know, you set when the bear's weight goes down on it and it's hard without visuals to explain yeah, sure. all this, but the spring tightens the, the loop around the bear's wrist and then it's tethered to the tree. Okay. So when you're live trapping bears, you're checking your, your traps regularly. Um, and let me just say that these are all methods that are standard protocol that have been tested by many, many uh, biologists and have been approved by all kinds of animal care committees. And, um, and the, this is done very carefully. To, yep. and, and, uh, the intention is to, to release an uninjured bear, obviously. Exactly. To release what we call, a, a, it's been drafted into the program. So the bears that get caught are the few that get drafted in to give us the information that allows us to conserve the many. Right. So these are a few bears mm -hmm. that we, um, it's intrusive. You know, we, we identify these animals. We put radio collars on them. We put ear tags on them. We tattoo their lip. We pull a tooth. Uh, these are all techniques that are done to track these bears to, so we know how many young they're having, how healthy they are, how big they are. And then we can extrapolate out and model mm -hmm. what the population looks like, okay. you know, what the age structure is, um, you know, uh, age structure is one of the most important things. Just like in Maine, that people talk about, oh, you know, this is an, our state is an aging population. We need to recruit more young people into the state mm -hmm. so that we can have a vibrant economy. Right. It's the same idea, you know, you want to have good age structure for bears. You want to have young being recruited into the population. You don't want too many bears being recruited into the population, which... We're, we're, our population size is pretty high right now, but just to get back to that. So, so you, the, the trap, um, would snare the bear and then, you know, it has the radio collar and that allows you to, to track it to the den in the winter time and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, but I don't, well, we were know. talking about, a, you had a story about how she was beaten. Oh, mean Jean. Yes. Thank you. Hey, we'll get right back to the show, but I wanted to take a moment to tell you how you can see season one of wild fed. If you head over to wild-fed.com right now, you'll see that pre-orders for season one are available alongside the season one experience. Both will begin on January 6th of 2020. If you choose the show on its own, you'll get access to a new episode every week for eight weeks. Remember, these are 30 minute episodes, not the 22 minutes of a typical TV show. If you choose the program, it'll include season one, but each week, along with a new episode, you'll receive a director's cut, where our producer Grant Giuliano and I break down the episode, discussing the background, the gear we use, the places and people and stories involved, as well as some of the comedy that took place on the side, some of the drama, some of the intrigue that we couldn't squeeze into the 30-minute format. You'll also get exclusive access to a weekly live Q&A where we'll be answering your questions and discussing how you can get started hunting, fishing, and foraging for food. Additionally, this will all take place inside of a private member group where you'll have access to me and the WildFed team for a full nine weeks, as well as a community of like-minded folks. If you just want to see the show on its own, it's 49 bucks. If you want to join me in the nine week program, that's just 249 bucks. Go over to wild-fed.com to get the show or sign up for the program. Now, here's the rest of the podcast. Yeah, so Jean uh, had been in the snare. And when you go up to the snare, we call it the circle. So uh, the bear will have been uh, snared for some time. You know, we check, we check traps regularly enough that it's, you know, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not a good experience for the bear. I will say that. It, it's stressful. It's stressful. So it's trying to get out of the snare. So it ends up making a circle because it keeps going around that tree. Right. Because that, that cable is tethered to the tree. So when you usually when you get to, to a trap site and you, you know you have a bear, they've decimated all the vegetation yeah. in that yeah. circle. You know, they've been going in circles. Around like, down a big circle. You know, but you'll come up onto a big confident male and he'll just be laying there waiting for you. And he'll just be like, <laughs> what is this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you'll get the young subadult bears that are pretty freaked out and scared of you. And they're all different, their personality. So when you approach the so, bear... So like a dog, you find like individual personalities are pretty clear. Yes, very yeah. much. Yeah. So when you, when you approach the snare, your next task is to immobilize the bear so that you can you know, so it's sedated so that you can um, collect biological data on the bear. 
So we immobilize. You got a syringe on a stick? So that's what I was going to explain. So we have what's called a syringe pole, and it's a syringe on the end of a metal pole. And uh, the bear is very, it's in den work, you can, um, you know, uh, give this bear the drug in some ways easier because the bear is in the den and pretty slowed down and pretty still, although you don't always know what you're looking at because you want to make sure to inject the bear in a safe place. It's hard because when you're looking at a bear, a black bear, it's hard to tell what's what because everything is so dark black. Right. They just absorb all the light. Oh, and yeah. It's like, is that an arm? Is that When the you neck? look what into a bear seeing? den, it takes it's a practiced be. eye to know because you want to get it into the hindquarters. Okay. And uh, It's an intramuscular injection. Yes. You want to get it into that really strong muscle into the back, the hindquarters. So uh, when you're trying to syringe pull a bear that's in a snare, it can be interesting because they're moving a lot. And, right. and the pole is only so long. So Mean Gene <laughs> got the name because basically you got to keep your, your eye on your feet. You don't want your feet in that circle because at that they point, the you. bear can reach you. And they're fast. So they're fast and they're strong. Yeah. So um, when you're getting close with that syringe pole, you're, you have this <laughs> kind of like boundary with your feet. And you can see it's like the ground is all torn up and then there's the regular vegetation. So, you're, so um, the gentleman who was working on the bear study that year, he uh, lost his footing. Well, he lost his eye on the circle and he got his feet a little bit too close to the circle. And Jean reached out, grabbed him by the shoelaces and pulled him in. (laughs) And his coworkers are pulling him back the other way. And it was, you know, it was kind of like a bluff. Black bears do a lot of bluffing. So she didn't hang on very long. Um, but so she got that nickname Mean Jean. And that's the story I've heard. This is yeah. like second or third hand at this okay. point. You know, bear stories I think tend yeah. to yeah, tend to get a little bit um what's the word? Uh more colorful or mm-hmm. maybe a little more dramatic. So uh Jean had, had been pulled into the to the snare and to the snare circle and everything was fine. It was safe and they got her immobilized and they followed her for many years. Um so working her in the den was a treat because she was very docile and she was the exact opposite of her nickname. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was asked to track her on a slow day one, um, one summer day in New Mexico to, to go and see, you know, I think I was looking to see if she had cubs because we hadn't, we hadn't got her in the den that year or something like that. They typically have cubs every two years. That's right. Yes, their cubs are born in January. Then the the cubs um, will den with mom again uh, that next winter, mm-hmm. and then they'll uh, disperse from the from the mom and, and be, they're born, be on their own is, at fifteen or sixteen months, something like that. And sometimes I see them at that age together still. Like they'll be two together running around like yearlings. That you know, I'll see them on game cameras. Oh, like, after they've dispersed, yeah, yeah, like where they'll hang yep. together still. Yeah, probably. It's a pretty scary Super world. Cute, to you know? be a... um, it's emblazed in my mind from the main guides test. You know, this piece of like this one fact you need is that they're born eight ounces hairless and, you know, blind. Blind, yeah, yeah. that's it. Um, so they're born in the den, eight ounces hairless and blind. And when they emerge, they're like little hairy little cubs. Yes. They are so cute yeah. at that point. Yeah, I mean, you've exactly. handled a bunch of these, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. How do you not want to just take one oh, home? They're, they're so adorable. They're really, really the most magical and beautiful thing yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah. And a bear den itself is is a miracle. Wow. It's just, you know, because um, you got to think this animal has not... Um, and we got to get back to the yeah, Mean Gene story. Yeah, I want to hear story. Should I do that first? Yeah, go okay. ahead. People so, know they're cute. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I was going to talk about the physiology, which okay, is really interesting. But um, so Jean, um, I was supposed to be tracking her, and forgive me, it was many, many years ago, so I don't remember why, and I think there was actually some miscommunication, but I took the uh, radio, radio antenna, knew her signal, you know, had her punched into, you know, you can punch in their number into the... Um, receiver and you go out with this H antenna and you can point at different directions beep, and you, beep, beep. you know where they are, you know? And um, I had a friend with me from Montana. My, my dear friend Shaney was with me and uh, New Mexico is really interesting. There's kind of these canyons where one side of the Canyon will be kind of Ponderosa pine and the other side, depending on the aspect of the, of the, of the slope yeah. will have a totally different vegetational community. So I just remember we were side hilling and I knew she was close because the signal was really close. The beeping was getting loud. And I said, there she is, Shaney. She's right there. And we, and we ducked behind a tree 
And we just were able to watch her in her natural habitat doing her thing. Unaware of you. Unaware of me. And she was alone. She didn't have any offspring. And she, at that point, she was getting pretty old to have offspring. And she's not a big bear. She's maybe 120 pounds. And she's just flipping these rocks, you know, looking for insects, ants mostly. Protein is an important part. Yeah. Insect protein is an important part of a bear diet. So we're just fascinated. We're watching her, you know. And and because uh, I so rarely, I got to watch a lot of brown bears in their natural habitat, but not black bears, you know, just because of the nature of the habitat. It's very yeah. hard to watch a black bear. A lot of bear. cover and they're more reclusive. Right? right, exactly. So at one point the wind shifted and she bolted literally in the blink of an eye i have no idea where she went but she caught our scent and she was gone did not hang to figure out what it was exactly right? and that's why she lived so long in, okay. in that in that area where there was quite a lot of hunting pressure but she was a very smart bear and that's something that i often um i often point out to people that um bear behaviorally they're very different and you have some bears that are very very wary and then you have riskier bears and, um, you know, uh, the bait hunting it can be really hard for some people to, to get a handle on in terms of ethics. It doesn't feel right. But um, when you are bait hunting a bear, you're bringing, in, you're bringing in a bear that's a little more willing to take risks. And so... Um, Especially those ones that come in and... Uh, watching the cameras, I see the, the big bears who got big by not getting caught. Mm-hmm. They come in two in the morning, three in the morning. They're never there in the day. And then you see these bears who'll come in in the daylight. Yeah. And they take those risks. Oh, right like, in the daylight. Yeah. You know, or they're, and maybe because they're, they're not allowed to come in because that bigger bear is in there. Yeah. But, you know, you'll see the sow with cubs. She'll come in in the dark. She'll put her cubs up the tree, yep. eat, you know. But then you see these young, precocious males who'll slip in there. It's five in the afternoon, yeah. 2 p.m. And it's yeah. like, wow, risky. You yeah. Know? And those yeah. ones, get taken out of the population. They do. And this is what's like, when you're thinking about Jean, you know, she um, produced a lot of, of bears. You know, she had a high, fecund she had a high amount of recruitment into the population of bears with good genetics. And she was teaching them those behaviors. Mm -hmm. She was teaching them how so to they, be smart. They do have like, they have instinct and they also have learned behavior, right. cult cultural stuff that they learn. Exactly. Okay. So she, every cub that she'd ever had with her, every yearling that she'd ever had with her, she'd taught them. When you smell that, yeah, we are out of here. When you smell that, it's danger, and you, yeah. you, you. But, but, I went up to those rocks that I had seen her flipping so casually with one paw, <laughs> and I, mm, yeah. and I'm trying to push the rock yeah. over because they were heavy rocks, yeah, and it really gave me an idea of how powerful these animals are, like pound yeah. for pound, yeah. You know, they don't have to be big to be strong. Right. They, their muscle density is incredible. My goodness, it is. And yeah. they also, um, I don't want to go too much into this, but I, I've seen bears fall out of trees, mm -hmm. hit the ground in a way you're like, that would break every part of me. Right. And they run off. Exactly. And it's unbelievable to me like that they're so resilient as well. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's he's been hound hunting for more than 30 years, so he's pretty um, experienced in it. And he's convinced that older, smarter bears learn to leave the bait sites on the track of mm -hmm. younger bears and sort of sneak out in a way that, that will throw dogs off so that the dogs run the other bear. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you think that that's possible that they understand. Cause you know, he, uh, here's something he said to me too. He said, he said, Dan, think about this. He goes, Dan, you think about this. <laughs> Imagine you spend 30 years in the woods and you never heard TV or traffic or loud noises. You've only heard the sounds of nature. How good are your ears? Mm -hmm. you, got the scent, you got the scent capability of a dog. Mm -hmm. How, you've never smelled perfume. You never smell, you know, and he's pointing yeah. out to me like this animal has been that many years, 20 plus years in nature without having its senses dulled by everything the way that exactly. we do. Yeah. How clear is it and aware of everything in that environment? Mm -hmm. um, and then if every year it's used to the, okay, now the dogs are coming. Okay, now the, the mm -hmm. bait hunters are in the woods. Um, do you think some really learn how to take advantage of the food resources that are being put in by hunters and then also how to get out of there? I think absolutely. Yeah. So I, I mean, be at all so how intelligent are they? That's, I guess that was my original question. You know, do we know? Well, that's a really difficult question. Yeah. You know, I think we know a lot about how intelligent parrots are, or how intelligent right. rats are, because we can study them really closely. We can study them in captivity. And Safely, we, too. You know, and um, I'm, 
I don't know of a lot of studies uh, with bears looking at intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, there are a lot of zoo bears that they could do research mm -hmm. on. Oh, like so they used to have circus bears. I don't know if oh, that's still yes, a thing. that's, that's still awful. A thing? Um, I hope Terrible, not. Huh? And you know, in, in parts of Asia, they, they would milk bears for their bile. Whew, it's very small. I mean, I've I've seen some of these documentaries that where you see bears in cages that it's yes. like a veal calf, yes, but kept alive. That's absolutely abhorrent. horrifying, right? Yeah, horrifying. Yeah, and that's the one thing that I would I would welcome anyone who has questions about the ethics of hunting. Is you know, my mom she grew up in New Jersey. Okay, my dad grew up in Maine. He I come from a long line of, of Mainers, you know, my ancestor, John Marsh was one of the first white men to live around Orono. And, um, and, you know, we have all these lines back on the Mayflower, long history in Maine, I'm very proud of it. But then my mom's from New Jersey, forgive me, please. Where the bear hunt has been banned. Has it? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I certainly know a lot of those mid-Atlantic states, they, they have tremendous problems managing their bear population. Mm -hmm. And because of, you know, there, there's biological carrying capacity and there's cultural carrying yeah. capacity. How much, how many bears can the land support from a habitat perspective is biological carrying capacity. Cultural carrying capacity is how many bears can people tolerate. tolerate. Have you seen that video? And it says it's a neighborhood in New Jersey and two full grown, these bears look like they're five hundred plus pounds mm -hmm. and they're just battling it out in the street there's mailboxes and cars oh cars are coming by they're just tearing each other apart in the streets and it's like that is how i think of cultural carrying capacity yeah. it's like that's where we're like that's too many bears for this well, area bears den under people's porches no way really? in pennsylvania oh wow i've read about that and um you know there's no hunting there and mm -hmm. and the bears are just you know we're in their habitat yeah you know and yeah, that's a good point um they come you know we talked about dispersal we talked about when the bear is you know in june um when the bear's a year and a half not quite and they're going to go off on their own they got to find somewhere to live so you have all these bears kind of dispersing and they don't they don't defend territories but they have home ranges and you know there's there's good food here and and this is you know highly nutritious food site here. And so, and I'm talking all natural foods. There's only so many of those places that they'll tolerate each other. I mean, black bears don't really like to do this communal kind mm -hmm. of feeding behavior like the brown bears, it's a totally different ecosystem. So um, you got to be thinking about it. The, the, the young bears are getting pushed out into the human um, wildlife interface. Oh yeah. You know, that's where the, that's where the, we see them eating out of the bird feeders and stuff. Yes, exactly. And I just saw on Facebook, uh, the main wildlife page, somebody had posted a picture of a bear sleep like l on the ground near their feeder and, and all the comments about, Oh, so cool. I love bears. I love seeing it. And only a couple people had said, bring your bird feeders in, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and someone had said, oh, well, they only stop by every once in a while. I'm not that worried about it. There's a lot of natural food. Yes, maybe, but natural food's declining. That's why they're going into the den mm -hmm. because the, the food is, the food after the fall, kind of the, the nut crop is by and by, they're going to go into the den. Mm -hmm. And so this person with no ecological expertise can see this as, oh, it's fine, but Feeding from a bird feeder, that's a pretty low energy output. It's a lot of high nutritious. You high know, calories, so no work. Sunflower seeds have a lot of yeah. a lot of nutrition. So I why that. not I see that in bellies? Why lot. not camp out at a bird feeder? And mm -hmm. but and and I said, please, I respectfully, please bring your bird feeder inside. This is not safe for humans or bears, because mm -hmm. as soon as that bear starts to associate a, a, a human dwelling with food, you have a problem. Then the bear has a learned behavior and it's no longer afraid of, of humans. And when the bear loses, you know, I don't like that we have to keep bears afraid of people, you know, from a spiritual kind of angle. Right, right, right. Um, my, my best experiences with bears have been when I felt that I was in the wild with the bear and I was, I was part of, of the landscape. Animal. Another landscape. Another animal. Another animal, exactly. But that fear of humans that has evolved because we have been their primary predator is, is very important to keep mm -hmm. bears safe and to keep humans safe. And so as soon as they start that habitual kind of right. behavior of, of finding an attractant and going back, of course they're smart. They're going to keep coming back where the food right. is easy. 
And then, and then people are going to start saying, oh, I can't let my kid outside. I'm scared what the bear will do. But we're creating this problem. Yeah. We're the problem, not the bears. Right. So, I, you know, that area around North Conway, Jackson, where you have towns, tourist towns with tons of dumpsters and restaurants. Right. And you have all of that wilderness around there. Mm -hmm. And man, those dumpster bears, right? They get oh. so bold. Oh, yeah. Right? And, uh, and then you have all of these social caring capacity issues that emerge. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and um, you and I have both spent time out west and uh, you've got to hang your food when you go camping. Right. You know, people don't understand how fortunate we are in Maine to have as many bears as we do. And we, we, we've been pretty sloppy. You know, we, mm -hmm. we keep our bird feeders out. When you camp, people keep their cooler out all night. You know, um, when we went to Alaska, even if your, your shirt smelled like bacon grease, yeah. you're asking <laughs> you're for it. it. <laughs> you know, if you cook bacon that morning, which mm -hmm. we didn't, we never lived that well in the field. But, you know, you got to be thinking about any scent that's on your, your body, yeah. you know, and that's attracting a bear. And so we, the reason we don't have to take all those precautions is because bears, we've kind of developed this, you know, bears respect that, that humans are, are dangerous. And I'm not saying we have to be a threat to them, but they respect that. Yeah. They respect that human scent is, we don't co-mingle. Right. You know, something I heard, um, it was, I was watching a documentary. It's like a Werner von Braun or something. Anyway, it was, uh, it was Russian being translated, but this guy was trying to say something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, of ethically he felt, one reason he felt okay about hunting is he said, when I'm in the woods and an animal sees me, he knows nothing good comes of me. Mm -hmm. It's fair in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And I always think with farm-raised animals and um this isn't a slight against it. Everybody has got to get their food from somewhere, but it's mm -hmm. like, I always think it's weird. You know, you raise an animal and you feed it day after day and mm -hmm. you develop this intimate relationship. And then one day comes the big betrayal, mm -hmm. you know, whereas with hunting you know, animals, you're, you're on, in, on kind of mm -hmm. equal ground in there. It's like, Hey, I'm in here. You've got all these great senses. You know why I'm here mm -hmm. versus like, well, you're petting the animal and you're feeding it day yeah. after day. And one day, boy, it's like, we're going over into this room today, right. you know? Right. You're going to freezer camp. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How do people, um, let's pivot for a second. Cause I want to respect your time today and I could talk about bears for 10 hours, but, um, how do people, I, you were kind of saying before, no matter how much land you have, whether it's like an urban apartment or you have, you know, 10,000 acres, you, you're kind of um, a steward of a piece of the planet and therefore you can maintain habitat to some degree. Mm -hmm. And you were just talking about this. It's like some people are thinking, well, I'll put out bird feeders because I care about this, these songbirds. I mm -hmm. care about these migratory birds. But at the same time, you can create problems for other wildlife by doing that exact thing so how do right. you like handle that that exactly. balance of those things you know well and that gets back to what i was saying about a lot of my clients there how do i keep the deer from eating all my shrubs or how do i keep the deer from eating all my hostas and um and and by the same breath um they may sometimes have a very negative view of hunters and so part of my education is helping people to understand that you know there are other parts of New England where the deer browse is so heavy that you you literally go into a forest and there's no understory. There's right. no regenerating trees or shrubs because the deer are eating all of them. Okay. So, so actually damaging the forest itself. The ecology is completely altered because the deer density is so high. Now, now white-tailed deer, as I understand it, because you look at most species and you see how, how many species have been negatively impacted by the colonization of the Americas, mm -hmm. but white-tailed deer populations I've been, I've been told are higher now than when Columbus came because human, they're one mm -hmm. of the, one of the species that sort of, I don't know what's the word, anthrophilic or something. They, mm -hmm. they do well around mm -hmm. human settlement, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we create that edge habitat that mm -hmm. they like, right? So mm -hmm. their populations are sort of almost unnaturally high because our population's unnaturally high. Well, and we, we no longer have the wolf. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we no longer have the mountain lion. Yeah. Extirpated um, from Maine. Yeah. We've lost, you know. They're um, still on the posters. On, <laughs> on my blog, there's a there's a article I wrote about carnivore coexistence and how important it is to recognize the value of um, top-level mm -hmm. carnivores like coyotes and 
um, how there we have this very um, kind of toxic history. Uh, very toxic history as I humans. Mean, wow, with it's, it's gnarly. You know, too. very competitive, and yeah. also there's so many myths. Around yeah. coyotes. I mean, I could do a whole show with you on coyotes. We should do it sometime. Hunters <laughs> um, have such a... Um, the PR for wolves and... Uh, mountain lion seems different because there's this hunt. But but with coyotes and, and wolves, boy, do do hunters dislike them. And mm-hmm. I keep trying to point out the irony to hound hunters. Mm-hmm. Because I have friends from Wisconsin where they lose dogs routinely to wolves. Mm-hmm. And so they wish they could kill all the wolves. And I, I kind of try to point out, like, your dog is a wolf. Mm-hmm. Your dog is a domesticated wolf. So what's the irony that you're tr- you're upset that an undomesticated dog ate your domesticated dog while you were trying to run that dog after animals? Well, just, what a limited view. I feel you're like that You're only too. thinking about yourself and what your needs are. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's just, unfortunately, that's really kind of a trademark behavior of yeah. humans. Um, you know, whenever something is viewed as, as a threat to whatever pursuit or resource that we find is most important, then it immediately is an enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, coyotes on the landscape are so important to keep rodents under control and to talk about balance, you know, that it's very important for us to have those upper level predators to, cause what happens if you don't, then the mid level predators, like, like the raccoons and, fishers. you know, f- well, fishers, they're kind of close to the top. They're pretty amazing. Are they, yeah? Um, but you know, you get your raccoons, you get your domestic cats that are outside and then you have, n- you, you know, you have nothing controlling those populations and those populations can really, it, uh, th- just, flourish and then they're killing a lot of birds they're predating a lot of songbird nests they're um you know reducing the biodiversity i mean they've done studies where they've shown landscapes where there were coyotes removed are much less biodiverse than landscapes where you have so so your mid-level predators even though they seem like they have a small impact individually cumulatively if unchecked by top tier predators will right. actually they have just a huge get, impact. They just get bloated wow, and, that's interesting. and they, they're not cause they don't yeah. have any predators. Right. And so, um, so that that's happened too, but I, I just want to get back to what you were saying about, um, the deer and how we were talking about the deer over browsing and, yeah, and, and I, hunting. I was asking about kind of, um, this idea of managing your little bit of habitat, yeah. you know, and yeah. you, you said that a lot of people are asking you about how to handle the deer, but are maybe against hunting. Right. And the, uh, hunting is such an important method for us to keep those populations in check because I have, you know, what's hard is if a lot of people haven't traveled very many other places you, or you might, you're not an ecologist. So you're not talking with colleagues at meetings mm-hmm. and you're not seeing what's happening in other parts of the world where, you know, the deer population has become so dense that, that you can't grow anything in your mm-hmm. garden. Well, and a lot of people who recreate in the outdoors, they'll say, I love the outdoors. But when they recreate in the outdoors, they, um, are, they're loud mm-hmm. and animals, they don't see many animals mm-hmm. uh, or they don't have plant identification skills. Mm-hmm. So they see the wall of green yeah. and they're not seeing species. Right. Uh, and so even though they love the outdoors, they don't necessarily interact with individual species or right. see these relationships, yes. right? Even though they're out there a yeah. lot. Yeah, exactly. And even, you know, even when I talk about pollinators, I talk about um, Zen and the art of bee observation, where you just <laughs> go out into your garden and you just observe the the bees on your flowers. And we have all these native bees, like we have 270 different species of these solitary, well, 17 species are bumblebees, but the rest of them, 250 something are these solitary bees. Some of them are like race, you know, like race car green and they're tiny and you would think they were an ant if you weren't paying attention, you know, so it's this idea of exquisite attention. Mm -hmm. And I love that term. I don't know where I heard it recently, but we, we're, that is so lacking in our culture, this idea of exquisite attention. And that's what I feel hunting really gives you is when, when you go out onto the landscape with this goal of, of tracking an animal or, or intercepting an animal so that you may be able to harvest that animal for food. Uh, to me, that is, that is the most connected moment, you know, when you're out there looking at their tracks and that exquisite attention that's needed. It's so different than going for a walk. Yeah. You know, it's, Uh you're really trying to get in their head. Yeah. And so that's what I grew to to love about it. You know, I grew up 
with my dad was a hunter, my uncle was a hunter. Um, and I wrote this passionate essay as a teenager against hunting. And because my, <laughs> my father, unfortunately, um, hung a deer in the garage one night intentionally so my mom would drive her car into the garage and the thing would slap up against her windshield. Oh, and no. that was honestly traumatic for me. Yeah. And I just thought, this is sick. Yeah. I, I, hanging that deer is awful. And my mom was against hunting. And as I st- said earlier, she was from New Jersey. So she grew up very insulated from the hunting way of life. And so I was influenced by that. But then when I went to Sterling, I started meeting these people that were part that, that were like cutting their own wood and carrying their water and these very like people that, you know, they wear the, the Woolwich vest and they, you know, everything is, is leather and, and wool and, and canvas. And, you know, we're not talking about Patagonia. Yeah, you know, right, right, right. We're not talking about Patagonia clad people here. We're mm-hmm. talking about people with beards who, you know, they, mm-hmm. they, they um, tap their maple, sh- maple sugar, they tap their maple trees in the spring and they, they, this was like the sterling kind of person, the quintessential sterling person. I started to be exposed to these older people who were role models for me, who were growing their own food, you know, turning bowls made out of wood they had cut on their property, um, foraging for mushrooms and hunting. And I started to get my eyes open to this. And then it was this idea of, okay, well, if you're my mom, you're perfectly fine and bless her heart. She she admitted to me she would rather go to the grocery store and get ground beef on a white styrofoam tray that she had no relationship to. She didn't see the animal die. She didn't have to. To eating my wild turkey, which I begged her to eat yeah. on Christmas Day. Right. And I finally convinced her to eat it. It was very difficult. <laughs> and she knew. She said, I know there's no logic in this. And I said, Mom, this turkey lived a wild life. Yeah. It literally lived a wild life. It was completely unencumbered. It was, it was wild and free. It ate natural foods. And th- it died very quickly and very humanely. And right here in Maine, yeah. You know, there was like... And he wasn't going to live forever either. That's the other thing. It's right. not like they just go on living for a hundred years. Like right. Their lifespan's pretty short out there. And eating that Christmas dinner. I mean, yeah. when you think of those butterball turkeys yeah. and how they're raised and factory farming. And, you know, there's this whole other topic that we could get into, but it would take too long around, you know, meat and climate change and all of this. Yeah. And I I feel meat protein is really important to my health. I've just, mm. I'm connected to my body and how my body feels when I don't eat it. And I need it. it. It it makes me feel alive. It's part of my health. And if it's part of a three point five million year hominin evolution as well. You know? Exactly. Well put. Well put. I always so, say I was I was a vegan for ten years, and uh-huh. I always try to say like, hey, if we're gonna do like a, a an immediate transition, mm-hmm. like we need some population studies that this even works. Like we've been doing this three and a half million years. You don't just change that overnight. Right. You know oh, exactly. I mean? This is yes. like, this is who we are. So you guys can do your experiment, but quit telling everybody they need to do it. Right. Till we have some evidence. Like I'd like to see, you know, a couple of generations of kids raised this way before like that, that we almost are have to be defensive right now yeah. about meat is odd. Yeah. Cause this is who we are. Right. Well, and I often say to people, you know, you can tell a lot by an animal by, by just looking at its head. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're, if you're a prey species, you have these really large eyes and they're you know, back on yeah. your head so you can see behind you. You know, you can see something coming for you, like a deer is a classic yeah. example. And then you have your predators that have the eyes in front right. that are meant to pursue something. Yeah. And where are our eyes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I totally res- respect everyone's different opinions and diet choices, and but but I really try... I try not to be judgmental, but if I meet a vegan, I, I ask them a lot of questions. You know, why are you vegan? What you know, because sometimes it's because they don't like factory farming of, of meat. Sometimes Which it's Which is a noble, noble Yeah. Thing. Um it could be, you know, um it could be a whole suite of things. But from a wildlife ecologist perspective, I I I'd love to break that down for people, thinking about, well, what are your meat substitutes? Because if you don't have a ton of time, you're probably not eating enough of all of the different things that you need. And not, not to say that meat is essential, but you have to be careful in how you yeah. curate your plate when you're a vegan. Right, you know, right. you have to get good uh, veggie sources of protein and things like that. So a lot of people are buying these mass-produced veggie burgers and soy products and yeah. things. So a lot of the soy comes from China. 
Um, and you massive know, amounts of habitat are required. To that's what it. I was going to get to is is the monoculture of um, you know soybeans. Thinking about how like the process of actually creating that veggie burger and what goes into it and and the tractor trailer shipping of your food from the other side of the country um, and the monoculture, the land that that has been converted from habitat mm-hmm. to um, intensive agriculture. Uh, it, to me, that is that is such a bigger footprint yeah. than hunting something yeah. out your back door. Mm-hmm. Or even, you know, um, I don't have any wild game in my freezer right now. I haven't had time to hunt. I, I've been growing my business. I have a, a, a daughter who I'm very devoted to, and she's gone out hunting with me. But uh, I haven't been able to do as much hunting as I did in prior years, and I want to get back to it. I'm very interested in doing some bow hunting. But, you know, I just don't have time to do that, but I want that meat, so I buy um, local uh, pig and Mm -hmm. and cow. I have a a cow that I buy from my friend. I I know where the cows were raised. I've seen their farm, you know. And it is not, like when you hear those statistics about what animal agriculture is doing to the planet, it's like that cow you're talking about isn't even part of that equation. Thank you. I know. Well, I saw a, a, a picture on social media the other day, and it said something like, shut the F up if your mouth's full of meat. You can't talk about climate change. And I thought that... Like so many things, it's complicated. Yeah, you wouldn't say and, that to a coyote. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? It's like if it's like if we we're an animal, and if we want to part, it's that's the awkward part. Is I think a lot of this has to do with that idea of human ecology and like wanting to participate in the cycle of life. And if you're doing that, I feel like you get like a pass. Like you're kind of exempt mm-hmm. from that story. Mm-hmm. You know, if your meat's not coming, like you can eat meat that doesn't come yeah. from that problem. But. The biggest problem is there's way too many of us. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's what that's everybody what, needs to be talking about. Everybody a, yeah. needs to be talking about overpopulation. Mm-hmm. That is the biggest problem. We can try to innovate and yeah. engineer our way out of this crisis, but until mm-hmm. we start talking about population growth, mm-hmm. it's it's over. I mean, yeah, you can't feed all of these billions of people on plants alone anyway. Yeah, any which way. Based on the, <laughs> the growth of humans, oh, you know? Oh, I wish we so. had another hour. I wanted, that's a really interesting topic to me. I always joke we need a predator, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, jeez. <laughs> Something that just, you know what I mean? Then those, then those with the least awareness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Okay. But I mean, yeah, that's a whole other topic, and I really agree with you, and I think that's the biggest taboo is mm-hmm. addressing that. Nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about, or if they do talk about it, the way it's approached doesn't really make Mm -hmm. sense to me. Because if you add more food into a system, you get more animals, Mm -hmm. right? It's like if you haven't, they always say we don't have enough food. And I'm always like, man, well, clearly we're making more babies. We have more than enough Mm -hmm. food because how do you get, what are people made of? They're made Mm -hmm. of food. Babies Mm -hmm. are made of food. So there's clearly surpluses being produced Mm -hmm. because we keep getting more people. So we're obviously over exploiting at some level because mm-hmm. we're growing more people. Well, right? especially in in the United States, mm-hmm. I mean, the food waste here is, is just sickening, and you know, people are shocked when I I just very openly say, you know, I have one child. We have one child, mm-hmm. and one one of the biggest reasons I could have had many children. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons was because. I only want to be responsible for one American footprint. Mm -hmm. That that's what I brought into the world. Because an American child, the footprint that they have, and even if you live like we do, where you try to be uh, gentle to the earth, it's it's still huge. You know, the impact is huge. So, And you have to weigh, like, like I look at the work you're doing, and I think um, you, your footprint has tremendous value, though, because you're... (laughs) <laughs> the work that you do ripples out right. and will reduce footprints in the future. So if you Let's need hope. to use some resources right now mm-hmm. to do that, there's the trade-off seems worth it mm-hmm. versus somebody who's sucking up tons of resources, but their contribution mm-hmm. won't lead to that in the future. Mm-hmm. So if I have to do this work with all of this equipment and electronics and all this stuff in order to get this message out, I right. think that's a trade worth yes, making. But I, I think agree. sometimes people are making a trade that isn't worth making. So I agree. I um, agree. I know you have um, a daughter to get to today. Um, tell people about uh, where they can get access to your blog and where... Well, actually, before I do that, do you have anything else that you want to... Because I could talk to you for a while. This I is know really this fun. is great. It's really fun. Um, I know there's so many things. That I didn't even... 
Uh, we didn't even get into the physiology we of bears. we do another show? Uh, well, it'd, be, it'd be really fun. We should <laughs> talk we about it sometime. Um, talk about resources. Bears have an amazing ability to, How much time do you have? to use those resources. Um, probably five minutes. Okay. So I'll, I'll let you have the floor here, and then I want to make sure we leave time to just talk about your, your, yes, where people can you. get your Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, I did just want to say, because we did talk about bears and how fascinating mm-hmm. they are, my favorite thing to share with people is the physiology of black bears. So we know a tremendous amount of it about black bear physiology. Um, they, you know, NASA has been interested in, in bear uh, research for a long really? time. Because be- of astronauts. Because. So um, we were talking about female bears and they give birth in January. So imagine, you know, you've got to put on a lot of weight. You've got to like maybe increase your body mass by 40% or something to get into the den in a healthy condition. And so you're, you're, wow, 40%. You're going to give birth in January in the den. You, you probably went into the den, depending on the food conditions. You probably went in, you know, November, maybe October. If, if that early, huh? Well, depends. Uh, November usually. Um, but if, if, for example, if you're in an area where there's not a lot of natural food, bears will den early. Okay. Um, but you go into the den and, you give birth and it's January. You haven't you haven't eaten or drank anything in a very long time, and then you're going to produce milk for your cubs. Lactate through that whole. You're going to lactate through With the no whole winter. No fluid intake. No fluid intake. Wow. And so you think the about fat makes sense to me, but there's no water in fat. So man, where's that water coming from? There, they they can get water out of the fat. Can they? But um, the part that I wanted to highlight was that you know I've been a lactating female. And I had to eat constantly <laughs> right, right, and right. drink constantly. Yeah. And so, so then they're nursing those cubs through to March. So a long time. Wow. And those, bear, those baby bears are growing a lot, you know, and they're, they're getting fully furred. They get those big, long claws. And everything about those little baby bears came from Mama Bear's nutrition. Right. Came from what she could feed on over the course of, you know, April to, to November. So... Uh, if we didn't consume any fluids or, you know, our urea would start poisoning us from the inside out. Yeah. The um, metabolic waste product of all yes. that. Yeah. And so what the, what the uh, bear can do is the bear can break the urea down into amino acids and then build, pro- no, build muscle. That is so they're so cool. actually, you know, because you would atrophy too. Your muscles would completely atrophy if you were in. Yeah, because urea is nitrogen rich. Yes. Yes. Wow. So they can turn So it they're into- building muscle with the urea. While they're basically like asleep. While they're in, well, it's more of a torpor state torpor, than a hibernation. Yeah. But yeah, and their their respiration wow. goes way down. Their body temperature goes way down. Um, their funny. heart rate goes way down. But they're still able to do all of that. And also too, Randy will tell you when you talk to him, but you can approach a bear that's been denning for weeks to months and it is capable of running off of the den like at full speed when it hasn't even moved for all that time. Oh my goodness. So like- to sprint when I get up in the position, morning, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so and I've been up uh, every day. <laughs> yeah, so that's my favorite thing to share about about bears. Oh but, my um, Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, to bring it back to the the kind of hawk's view, the ten thousand foot view of everything. You know, a, a recent uh, study that was published in Science, which is pretty much the most uh, kind of highly regarded scientific journal out there. Um, that we've lost 3 billion birds since 1970. Here in, or in the world or in, here in North America? In North America. Wow. So over the course of my lifetime, we've lost, and remember that a billion is 1,000 million. Yeah, yeah. 3 billion birds. So it, it's like one almost in, inverse to the human population rise in that time. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, and so people, and then if you could picture your favorite backyard birds, say you've got three bluebirds on, yeah. on a line. Um, one, you know, uh, a third, one out of every three birds is gone that we used yeah. to have, you know, if you could think about it that wow. way. So that shifting baseline thing, it makes it hard to see it. Right. Cause you're like, this is just how it's always been in my life. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So, and then the mass extinction, we really are, uh, experts believe we're in the sixth mass extinction and that people would say natural extinction happens, but the rate of the extinction now, experts believe it to be at least a thousand times greater than natural extinction rates. Do you think that there's 
this is a tough question to ask people, but I think it's important because it's like dominoes falling, right? Can like, can I go get a Prius and I reduce my carbon footprint? Like, is there a, do you, are you, do you have any reason to be hopeful about any of this or do you oh, think yes. that, that this can be stopped? I do. Absolutely. I mean, when you look back to bald eagles in Maine, for example, with DDT, you know, yeah. Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, you that know, would have been the seventies alarm. Yeah. Rung the alarm cry for, you know, DDT was poisoning our environment and that caused eggshell thinning in the bald eagles. And so, um, you know, we didn't know how toxic that was to, to the environment and we figured it out and we banned it. And then we did all these recovery efforts for bald mm-hmm. eagles and ospreys and, everywhere now. and, and it's so many now. So, I mean, that's just a success story. I think it's just a matter of, um, humility. I think yeah. that human beings need to recognize that we have gone so far off track and we are, we are destroying our life support system. Right. That is the only way I can say it Home is that this is our life support system and people that are so disconnected from nature, it's not their fault. They grew up in the city. It's they're, they're a product of their environment, mm-hmm. but everything that's well adapted to their environment yeah. too. Right? I mean, and everything that supports that environment comes from nature in some way. Mm-hmm. And so Nature is not the other. Nature is not out there. But without pollinators, for example, we're not going to have food. Mm -hmm. You know, without um, insects, you know. Do you remember you used to have to clean your windshield constantly because the insects were all over your windshield? We are losing insects at an alarming rate, and they are the basis for all life in this this, uh, landscape. So... um, I do have hope for it because it's just a matter of the the new generation, the younger people, you know, Greta Thunberg, she's amazing spokesperson for How young dare people. You? <laughs> oh, she's so, and she's you? a force of nature and she's, we need that. We need someone who's a little angry yeah, yeah. and a, and a little, you know, anger has a role. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and righteous so, in, I would call it righteous indignation. <laughs> yes. Yes. And she's right. Yeah. You know, and how dare you talk of your dreams yeah. of, of, you know, infinite economic, infinite growth. economic <laughs> growth. Exactly. And a lot of biologists and ecologists, we talk about what is wrong with a stable economy? What is wrong with a steady state economy? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, the, we cannot only be measured by our consumerism. It's very hard for people to get rich in that. That's yes. what it is, right? It's that for one individual to accumulate massive amounts of right. resources, it needs to be infinite growth. I yeah. mean, that's... The, Capitalism has been the problem. Yeah. Um, but I am hopeful because I see uh, awareness around me. And I, and I see just in my, in my, my favorite quote is Clarissa Pinkola Estes, men the part of the world that is within your reach. And mm. that's what I'm doing in my okay. work is just trying to mend this part of the world. Right. And you can't do it all. But if we all do our own little part, whether it be planting the right shrub or talking to your grandkids about what you learned about how important insects are and how we can't, you know, just be using chemicals all over our landscapes or whatever it is, like this plastic toy, this, this is, this is, it has a footprint. Where was it produced? Where is it going? Mm-hmm. Is there something else that you could do with yeah. your time? Do you even like creative? it? Creative, <laughs> you know, and, and people go to, go to these box stores and they buy stuff and they don't think about where it comes from. Mm-hmm. But it's just that awareness. So I, I do have hope. Um, it's got to be all hands on deck yeah. at this point, right? Yeah. And I think this kind of getting back to primitive skills and living closer to the land. And it's when you know that natural place that you care about it. And so if we can get people out in the world, being in nature more, it's healing, it's therapeutic, and it will make people care mm. a lot more. So. Well said, and I agree, and thank you. And where do people find more of your work? Yes, so uh, firstlighthabitats.com, or you can... And you blog there. Yes, I have a blog there that, that there are a lot of articles on there about all kinds of different stuff that people mm-hmm. can read to get inspired. And you write really eye-opening pieces. I oh, mean, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's thank very, you. you know, I mean, obviously people hearing from you now kind of get a sense of what you're like, and your writing, I think, opens people's eyes probably to many 
layers of connections that they weren't. Oh, thank you aware of. so much. That's good to hear because I'm working on a book. So okay. <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> I need encouragement. And uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram, uh, First Light Wildlife Habitats, or you can look for uh, hashtag the personal ecologist. Oh, cool. So, um, and I do lots of talks, um, walks and workshops for in Maine and New England, but um, certainly online there's there's a lot of information and, and you can follow the phonology notes so you can <laughs> week by week be wowed by nature. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope that we can sit down with you again. This was awesome. And yes. th- we, there's a lot of unexplored terrain here in this conversation. Oh, I know. So, I know. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks for being so generous with what you know. And, Thank and thanks you, for Daniel. the work you're doing. Yes, you too as well. Very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.